Welcome to issue 207 of Critical Encounters, a podcast about Marvel Champions, a living card game by Fantasy Flight Games. Here, we take a good look at that most critical piece of the game, the encounter sets. We'll discuss those poorly understood characters, unfairly labeled villains, and their various plans to shape humanity and benefit the planet, as well as those so-called heroes intent on thwarting them. I am one of your hosts, Darcy, and joining me tonight is Steve. Hello, how Steve. are you doing? How's I'm going? so good, how are you doing? I'm doing great, doing great. And most importantly, of course, is not Mike, not Daniel, but it is in fact the board game lawyer, Mr. Bill himself. Hey, Bill. Hey, James. Good to hang out with you again. Great to hang out with you as well. I do have a favor to ask of you, um, Bill. The last time I turned up without seeing Daniel, uh, Mike, and Steve had their way with me. Um, oh, okay. Yes. Wow. Uh, it, yeah. You know, minion, minions unite. I feel like there's like, this is a, a two on one situation here. Actually, Steve, you shouldn't be here for this conversation. Ah, it's okay. Yeah, that's all right. Because people have noticed there's no Daniel and there's no Mike. This is our very first issue of Volume 5. And people asked for it. They wanted some big changes. And that's it. Mike's out. Daniel's out. Bill's in. James in. New show. Off we go. Right? Minion right. Revolt. Let's yeah. get going okay. here. All right. Does Sounds these great. colors stay on forever? Is this staying on or do we get to take those no, off? No, no, no. We'll, we'll take those off at the end of the show, you know, uh, if everything goes good. It's like a probationary period here. But by the end of 207, I think we'll just promote you guys to full-time villains. And, and uh, Mike and Daniel, if they decide to show up, then, uh, you know, we can talk with them then. So, All right. All right. Finally, villain pay. <laughs> Been waiting yeah, for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Four, four years. Uh, finally, uh, we ousted those two guys and off we go. So Okay. Uh, Boom. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for being here at the start of Volume 5, guys. Since, since yes. the other guys couldn't be bothered. My <laughs> absolute right. pleasure. Yes. Well, seeing seeing as it is, you know, the start of uh, Season 5, and there's no Daniel, and there's no Mike, I guess it's only fitting to see what's on your mind tonight, Steve. Oh, thanks. Oh, I feel so special here. I feel like Daniel. Well, okay, better. But uh, what is on my mind? It is an email from Joao that we got. And I'm just going to read it here. So it says, hey, guys, first off, great job fighting the bad fight. Someone must speak up for the bad guys all over. Thanks for keeping me company on my morning commute to work. Having two spawns makes it very hard to play the game as much as I'd like. And listening to the podcast scratches that itch for me. Oh, good, good. And then he says, 0.4% is the answer. Well, we must have asked a question, huh? Uh <laughs> After a long review of many published articles on the matter of renowned PhDs such as Dr. Otto Octavius, Dr. Victor Von Doom, Dr. Kurt Connors, a.k.a. The Lizard, as well as statistical data, the consensus of scientific community is 0.4% of the total Earth's population carries the X gene. Keep up the evil work, Joao. Okay, we guessed. How many people are mutants? And there's the answer, 0.4%. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. I like the statistic instead of the, the hard number. Right. Yeah. 0.4%. People have the X gene. Mm. That means maybe one of our minions has it? Probably not. I don't know. So, mm. yeah. But thanks for that email. And um, yeah, Thanks for clearing that up. I, yeah. I haven't been able to sleep since. Actually, you know what? He's got a PS here. All right. Oh, uh, PS. Sure. Sure. Yeah. PS. It's a lot of work keeping the place spotless. I think if I may perhaps suggest, if you'd be so kind as to eventually, not urgently, possibly, consider assessing the likelihood of sometimes in the future, giving me a raise, maybe? You know what? Forget that. What's the future anyways? Yeah, I forget I said anything. I'm good. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So that's his, it's his assignment? Is to keep the lair clean? Of spots. Spot of spots. spots. Okay. Yes. Yeah, well. Yes. So he's supposed to keep it spotless. Huh. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I stepped in one on the way in, so I'm yeah. thinking maybe not doing his job. Yeah. Well, we can talk. I mean, you guys got a promotion, so why can't he? Right. Okay. So. Right. Maybe Wait, we this, could help him out. This is a promotion. Uh, that's what we're pretending it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why oh, you don't you don't like the new? I mean, we even got rid of the smell for you, James. I just assumed that that was because Daniel went away. Yeah. See, we got rid of the smell. <laughs> Oh, how pleasant, how pleasant it is to come to work in this new, this new feel, 
Hearts new the chair. New- yeah new year new crew new you bought year. you bought daniel and mike new chairs and they're not here to sit in them i get to break this in that's great wonderful yeah and bill you are doing a lot of the heavy lifting tonight so oh. let's talk about that right what are we doing tonight um well we are going to talk about exodus yes. and a little bit of the acolytes and you're going to give us some learning and um so uh yeah, let's, let's not beat around the bush anymore. Let's go for it. So Exodus, he is one of the most powerful mutants in the Marvel Universe. So it's pretty exciting to do a story on him. In fact, he's considered an Omega-level mutant, meaning that his powers are near limitless. So hopefully, hopefully we'll see why that is the case as we explore his story today. So being that this guy is no slouch in the Marvel Universe, we should expect big things from this guy in the game, right? So hopefully we, when we get to the cards, we find that to be the case. So Exodus's first appearance was in the X-Factor, number 92, all the way back in July of 1993. So this guy has been around for over 30 years now, and there's plenty of time to build some story around a character in that amount of time. Now, I think sometimes we think is like 93 is being not that long ago, but 30 years is pretty good, pretty good span into the past. Make me feel old. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, and I'm, but I am guessing though, that probably Exodus is not one of the better known characters. Is that, is that, have you guys heard of Exodus prior to the game or prior to, prior to this? I'm going to hesitate to guess from the amount of mispronunciation of his name that I've seen online, though I think it seems pretty clear that it's Exodus. I don't think many people have heard of him. I certainly had not heard of him. Okay. Yeah, All me right, neither. Steve, Steve no. you haven't heard of him either. You know, and he's not one of the ones that just really jumped out to me. So I had to do a little bit of extra research for this one. But anyway, his real name is Beignet du Perry. I think I said that right. My French is not great. But he Wait, is like a... The, fr- like the New Orleans delicacy, like a beignet? Like beignet, beignet, is that what that is? Oh, okay, delicious. It's spelled Bennett, and I've heard people say Bennett du Paris, but it's actually Beignet du Paris, I think. Yeah, I would think I, w- I would think Bennett du Paris is a very American version of that name. Oh, okay, I think that Beignet really? has a G in it as well, so he's he's free of that. Beignet okay. du Paris, yeah, okay. yeah. So cool. Anyway, so. Who is he? He's a French knight from the 12th century who had a very active involvement in the Crusades. So he's like a normal human. He's a normal stature for a human male. But some of his notable features are that he has red skin, he has black hair, he has white eyes with no pupils. And that stays pretty consistent as a rendering from him for him throughout the comics. Now, personally, one of my favorite features about this guy is that popped collar that he's got. I think it looks fantastic. If you see it in the picture there, uh, he's got this really beautiful popped collar. It's not very functional, but when you walk into a room with something like that on, you're, you're telling everybody else, you know, I'm an Omega level mutant stand back. And that certainly works for him now. I mean, being uh, 800 years old, he's looking pretty good. He looks That's strong. right. I know it. I like it. I, I wouldn't mind dressing up like this guy. I think it's pretty cool. His mm-hmm. hairline's intact. He looks great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very <laughs> that handsome. must be his mutant power. <laughs> yeah, it works. So Duperry, from a young age, he knew that he had some kind of powers within him, even though they had yet to manifest themselves. So this guy grows up in medieval times. He he grew up in a different era. He had a different. He was in a different culture. He had a different attitude. But as he grows into a young man, he becomes really good friends with the fellow named Ebar Garrington, who was the Black Knight of that time period. And these two guys, they would go on various quests together. And one of the quests that they went on was in the Valley of the Kings in ancient Egypt. And this is where they hoped to find the dwelling place of the eternal Pharaoh. Now this dwelling place had an extremely fancy name. And I'm not even going to ask you guys to guess it, but this place was called the Tower of Power. Right? That's what they're searching for. (laughs) The Tower of Power. Super fancy. (laughs) I think that's the only really let down of this whole story was the name. I mean, they they came up with the Tower of Power. That's what they're looking for. Anyway. That's probably just a, that's just like an anglicized version. It was probably way cooler. That's just, that's just. I betcha. Yeah. Yeah, Lost in translation. Yeah. It has to have been. (laughs) The Tower of Power. That's what they're looking for. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, 
He was really tight with the Black Knight, uh, and befriending the Knight was very significant. So who is the Black Knight? Well, just very briefly, over many centuries, there were different individuals who took on the mantle of the Black Knight. Some of these were good, some of these were bad, but their history is intertwined with this mystical weapon that has been handed down through the ages, and it's called the Ebony Blade. Now, a recent iteration of the Black Knight is Dwayne Whitman, who is the nephew of Nathan Garrett, who was also a version of the Black Knight, who was one of the masters of evil. Now, Dane mm-hmm. Whitman, though, yeah, so he's yeah, mm-hmm. masters of evil, right? So great. Dane Whitman, though, is one of those heroes that aligns himself with the likes of the Avengers, the Defenders, the X-Men, yada, yada. And so, kind of disappointing, right? While he was fighting alongside the Defenders, though, he was turned to stone by the Enchantress. Valkyrie, yeah, yeah, right, so he's out of commission. Valkyrie, being the hero that she is, she sniped the Ebony Blade from him, along with his winged horse, Aragorn. She snatched him away. Doctor Strange, I guess he needed a cool statue for his mansion, so he took possession of (laughs) his body, right? (laughs) Wonderful heroes, they are. But it wasn't until sometime later that the good doctor tried to restore him by using the Eye of Avalon. So that's that's a a term that you may hear later, Um, but this Eye of Avalon, it's not related to any of the cards in the game. Um, There's actually a couple of different Avalons in the Marvel Universe. This is different. This is different. Anyway... Uh, This Eye of Avalon is what the Doctor's trying to use to bring him back, but it's to no avail because Whitman's spirit has been transported back in time all the way back to the 12th century where he would now inhabit the body of his ancient ancestors. And yep, the one that his body goes into is this Ebar Garrington who was the friend of Beignet du Perry, but Whitman wasn't alone. He was also transported back in time with one of the Eternals who is Circe. She was also sent back with him. Uh, I don't think they ended up in the same location that I can recall, but but they were both sent back in time. I don't know if you guys have had any, anyone else ever inhabit your body, but apparently this is not very comforting. It's not good for you. So Garrington, he was struggling, but he continued on this quest. And the two along the way had obstacles. And one of the things that they had to do was they had to fight one of the minions of Apocalypse. This was Sherid, but they managed to defeat him. But then Circe finds Garrington, fully awakens the Dane Whitman that's inside of him, and removes Garrington's consciousness, or what we could say is that Garrington at this point dies and is replaced by Dane Whitman. So Dane Whitman goes back in time and inhabits the old Black Knight. Now Black Knight at this point decides to abandon the mission of finding the Tower of Power, but Dupéry, he continues. Eventually, though, in this quest, he collapses But then a voice, knowing the future of of this powerful mutant, awakes him, awakens him, puts him to the test, and now his mutant powers begin to surface. Thus, he becomes now Exodus. In the meantime, Black Knight and Cersei are captured by Apocalypse. Apocalypse, knowing the future potential of the power of Exodus, orders that he kills the Black Knight and Cersei. Apocalypse does not want them interfering in anything down the road, but... Exodus turns on Apocalypse, and this is where we find out how powerful Apocalypse is, as he strips Exodus of his powers, rendering him unconscious, and seals him away in a tomb in the Swiss Alps. I know that we haven't talked about his powers yet, but that's coming up. It isn't until sometime later that a powerful mutant finds and awakens Exodus, thus returning him his powers. So that powerful mutant is Magneto. Magneto is the one who finds Exodus. So, any questions about that? James, are you following along with all right with this? What I mean, was all of that is my first question. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, there's a lot. So we've got. I'm curious. Yeah. Go on. I'm I'm curious how James feels about this whole like possession thing. Yeah. I I remember really being very confused and not feeling great, and then I was came onto the show to do stuff, and then it had already happened, and I don't like <laughs> it. So I don't really like any of this. Um. So we've so. Black Knight, like Black Knight from the game, the Blue Black Knight, sorry, the Blue Ally Blue Black Knight. Yes, yes. The Blue Black Knight. He is at one point buddies with Exodus back in the past? Correct. But not this Dane Whitman version. Right. So that was that... uh, uh... My only question within that is, so we have um, Benet, Beignet, Bennett, Dupéry, he's a French guy, 
yes. knows there's something inside of him and he's a crusader but while he's a crusader at least for a while he at least for his knowledge he is not a mutant or at least he's not he's not he doesn't start off as a like mutant powers okay. right okay. so so garrington his... garrington was his friend so garrington is the mm -hmm. black knight and uh, Dupéry is the future Exodus. So sorry if that wasn't very clear. Um, but anyway, it was the the Black Knight from the 20th century, Dwayne Whitman, that goes back in time and inhabits the body of Garrington. And Cersei is instrumental in removing Garrington's consciousness from that body. And so now it's being inhabited by by Whitman of the future. Okay. Oh, so. Bill, I've I've, to I've totally got it now. Okay, good. Say no more. All I'm, right. I'm totally with you. I've got, yeah, okay. I understand all of Sorry. this now. Yeah, there was, that was a lot of bananas. There's a lot of bananas. Yeah, there, right? it's not okay. so much that we can't follow along. So the question the, is, Exodus gets wakened up by Magneto, and that's, that's right. what we need to know about. Okay, all right. Yes. Pick up okay, from so there. Prior to that, he's also encountered Apocalypse. Oh, so right. he's had these yeah. two... Yeah. Yeah, like, so it's for centuries he's locked away in this tomb that Apocalypse put him in. So Magneto comes, rescues him, pulls him out, and let's talk about what makes this mutant so powerful. So there's a whole list of, of powers that he has. First off, he's a psionic of the highest order, meaning that his psionic powers are incalculable. He feeds off the psionic energies of the people around him. For example, in a fight with the Scarlet Witch, who's very powerful, we know. Jean Grey, who's also very powerful. Polaris, uh, Psylocke. He could easily defeat all four of them without much effort. That's how powerful he is psionically. He also like has it. tele yeah. He also has telekinetic powers that give him vast superhuman strength. And so one of the ways that we gauge metahumans typically it's calculated in tons. And so he can um it's it's easy for him to move one hundred tons telekinetically. Um he also has the ability to disassemble and reassemble extremely complicated devices uh and just um for instance, he can completely dismantle a sentinel, no problem at all whatsoever. He can take it with apart. With his mind. Yeah, with his mind, he can do that. Okay. Uh, one time he took apart a helicarrier and turned it into a giant version of Cerebro, which we know <laughs> Cerebro, it's like a scanner that you can use to find mutants. Yeah. And, um, I mean, he probably would be really helpful at work, you know, like getting the wireless printer to work, things like that. <laughs> so he has these abilities. He can also generate force fields that are nearly impregnable. I'll call those psionic shields. Uh, in addition to that, he has durability, which makes him invulnerable. He's also immortal. Uh, he can generate powerful energy blasts. Wait, I'm he sorry, can you just casually yeah. got to the point that he's immortal. He's just, he's right. just casually immortal. Yeah, yeah. Cool. he's immortal. Right, you know, pretty... it's... It's been issued to him. I mean, uh, that, to be fair, that saves them with a lot of retcons later. He never has to come back to life. He's just he just right. always lives. Yeah, he's there. Smart writing. He's just, he's going to be there for a while. He can generate powerful energy blasts. I mentioned um, he can fly. He has a healing factor, and we know that many mutants that we've talked about have a, a healing factor. But he can also be the healer for others, not just himself. And if that's not enough, he can even bring people back from the dead. Um, he can teleport things over great distances. He can teleport things out into space. He has mind control. He has precognition. How is this guy a minion in the back of the pack and not like his <laughs> own scenario pack? Right. And who did you say wrote right. this? It's starting to sound like if I sat down, you know, my child and said, okay, yeah, give, give me some more. What more powers can this guy have? Oh, yeah, oh. give him immortality, super strength. He can move everything. He can think of everything. He, he, has, he can also do he can also do astral projection. Yeah, let's give that to him too. <laughs> what else do you want to throw in? In fact, if you use any combination of these raw powers, you can create new ones, right? I could just go on and on and on. This guy is really powerful. Like I said, he's an omega level mutant, which is a very small percentage of the mutants, meaning that he is one of the most powerful mutants that ever existed. Okay, so if there's a, only a small percentage of the population are mutants, we learned 0.4% today. Yes. How many of those 0.4% are omega level mutants? That's my question to Joao. I want to know. Send us another email. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It may even be less than 4%, 0.4% of the 0.04% of whatever he mentioned earlier, right? It could it be, be tiny. Yeah. yeah it's, it can't be. It can't be 1%. Like four people, right? Like crazy. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
Go on. So Magneto would gladly make him one of his acolytes. So briefly, who are the acolytes? Well, they started as a small group of mutants who were loyal to Magneto and his teachings. They were led by Fabian Cortez. And the acolytes, they pledged to follow Magneto's principles, particularly the mutant right of superiority over normal humans. Now, some members of the acolytes worship Magneto with like this religious fervor. So they were kind of like a cult. Or uh, acolytes. And they, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. And they regarded him as the mutant messiah. Uh, they would sh- set up shop in space, orbiting the Earth on a space station called Avalon. Which, from what I gather, is made of pieces of Cable's orbital space station, Gray Malkin, and Magneto's asteroid M. That's where this Avalon comes from. So, spoiler alert, Fabian Cortez, who is the leader of these acolytes, would not remain as Magneto's number one. In fact, Exodus would replace him to become Magneto's right-hand man. And again, I'm not going to go much into the acolytes, because I think that we will hear about them later on a future show. But I will just say... That with regards to this group, Magneto approves. And he leans heavily on this group of zealots. And unlike many other groups like this, they're always looking for ways to swell their numbers. And Magneto is always on the lookout to cherry pick mutants from, uh, to bring others into his stable. But oftentimes, this would put him at odds with the X's, like the X-Men, the X-Factor. And on this particular occasion, uh, it puts him at odds with the X-Force. So Magneto sets his sight on two of their members, Sunspot and Cannonball. We'll recognize them from the game. Exodus attacked the X-Force, who were no match at all for his abilities, because we talked about what he can do earlier. Who is? And he successfully brought these two back with him to Avalon. So X-Force sets up this reconnaissance mission to try to retrieve their teammates, but they quickly learn the folly of attacking Magneto and Exodus in their own lair. So X-Force on this occasion really gets curb stomped and Magneto mortally wounds Cable. So there's a lesson there, heroes. Stay away from the villains in their own lair. Yeah. 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 Nothing good comes from it, right? Stay away. But later, Exodus would take another step up in rank when the X-Men plot an attack on Avalon. Now this time, Professor X is involved and we know he's the biggest cheaty hero out there and he successfully wipes the mind of Magneto in the process. So Exodus Mm. becomes the new leader of the Acolytes. Now in the Mm. comics, I think I mentioned it before, that no one ever truly stays dead. And I might add that no one's memory ever truly seems to be lost. So in time, Magneto would be back to his old self. And since Fabian Cortez is on the outs with Magneto, he needs to hide. It's very dangerous for him to be seen and for him to be caught in public because of Exodus being out there on on the prowl. And he does this for quite some time until he finally surfaces on the island of Genosha. Now, you talked about Genosha before on your show, Steve, I think. Yeah, I mean a little bit. Just a little bit? Okay. So, of course, this is an island near the coast of Madagascar, and it has a long history with mutants there. At one time, mutants were slaves, and even though times have changed slightly, it seems that there's always some kind of civil unrest on this island throughout the ages. And then in this atmosphere, it was ripe for Fabian Cortez to be brought back out into the limelight. War takes place between the humans and the mutants. And it's also discovered at this time that Cortez has been hiding Magneto's granddaughter, Luna, on the island. So because on this island of Genosha, there, it hits a boiling point, uh, it attracts all kinds of attention. So, yep, here comes the Avengers. Here comes the X-People. Here comes the Acolytes. And here comes Exodus. There's lots of fighting that takes place from this point forward. Now, earlier I mentioned that with his psionic abilities, that he was more powerful than like the Scarlet Witch and Jean Grey. And he fights them on this occasion. Also, Crystal's involved, who's a powerful um, psionic. I think she has a psionic power. She's a powerful inhuman. Their powers combined are no match at all for his. And so this is where he really demonstrates that. He easily defeat, defeats all of them in, this, in their three combined attack. He also, at this time, mentally controls Cortez, Fabian Cortez, forcing him to turn Luna over, and then he kills Cortez. But again, don't let your heart be troubled. Nobody stays Whoa, dead. Spoiler right. alert for next week when we talk about Cortez. Holy moly. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, so no one ever stays dead, right? 
It's at yeah. this point that he boldly declares to the mutants of Genosha that he intends to cleanse the nation of all humans. And so in a last ditch effort to try to stop him in his tirade, the Avengers and the X-Men combine forces and they go after Exodus. But even with the entirety of their combined efforts, they still prove to be no match for him until uh, in this mighty battle, Professor X unleashes an extremely powerful psionic attack on him, and it's only in this instance in the battle that he appears slightly phased. But it is in this brief moment that his old buddy, his old pal, his old fishing buddy, the Black Knight, sneaks up on him from behind and stabs him in the back with that ebony oh. blade. Oh. Right? Yeah. Hero stuff. Hero 101. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so thus he defeats Exodus, sending him back to Avalon to lick his wounds. Doesn't kill him, right? He's immortal. Right, he's immortal. And his right, but, 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 he puts a, but he puts a terrible hurt on him, and so he's chased off. But there's, there's certainly a whole lot more to the story of Exodus that I could go into. There's other storylines. There's a House of M. There's a House of X. There's a Messiah Complex. I know at one point he ends up being on one of the, gov- the one of the governing body of Genosha later on. So there's just a really rich story behind this extremely powerful mutant. <laughs> we don't but know. I really about. feel like I just need to leave it. I just need to leave it right there. Right. That, I've said a lot, you know. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, so, so, so powerful. Like, I think it's so fascinating that and maybe it ties into the sense of him, you know, being a religious crusader or a nation's crusader. I don't know if it was religiously driven at the time. Um, everything was, I'm sure it was religious, to then have him almost aligning with these kind of people of power throughout when he's like, sounds so much more powerful than any of them, maybe yeah. apart from Apocalypse. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, it, that's definitely in his blood, right? He's a crusader, so he's going to do whatever he can to push his agenda forward, right? Whatever it takes. And so these acolytes, they're, they're no joke. They are, they are a powerful group of zealots in the, in the service of Magneto. Yeah, and and we've seen that already. Magneto has been assembling all kinds of loyal minions. We've talked about weak ones. We've talked about strong ones. This one certainly would be his herald. He is the most powerful one that he has in his in his grasp. He's not very loyal. No No toad. toad. He's no toad. toad. Yeah. I mean, look at his tongue. Disappointing. (laughs) Wow. Well, Bill, that was great. Uh, I think that it's surprising that I don't really know much about him, considering the power level. And uh, yeah. maybe you know, maybe some folks will go out and they'll read some of the new stories with him in it and things like that. So I th- I think that maybe that could have something to do with it because they made this guy like so ridiculously powerful, like more powerful than Superman it seems. And so when you got somebody that that that's that powerful, I mean, really, you got to be careful how you use him, right? You yeah, probably don't true. want to overuse him. I would think that's probably the reason why. That's just my well, guess. Yeah. Should we look at the cards and see if he stacks up? I think that's where we're at. That's important, I think. Let's see. Is, yeah. is, are we going to fall flat on our expectation now that we've built him up to this level? But let's just No, no. Okay, so we're going to find Exodus in the Mutant Genesis wave, in the Gambit pack. It's in the back of the pack. Instead of hero cards, you get some, you know, some villain modular stuff. That's cool. Six total cards, four by title. I love that. Oh, too. yeah, that's great. Yeah, I um, love it. Yeah. Now, he's not required in any set, but obviously put him in if you're playing with the Acolytes, if you're playing Magneto, it sounds thematic. So, um, well, uh, Bill, why don't you take us with Exodus himself? Since uh, Okay. Yeah, let's take a look at this card. So, Exodus, how powerful is he? He's a minion with a scheme of one and an attack of one. Whoa! A one and a one? It sounds thematic so far. Well, okay, slow down, slow down. He's an acolyte who is... <laughs> what? That's the one. That's the one, okay. Uh, keep he's... going, Bill, keep going. He's elite. You killed me, man. Uh, okay, psionic. Good. He has uh, hit points of six. Okay, now let's get to the meat. He has retaliate of one. So yeah. less than Modoc. Okay. Okay. All right. He's villainous. All right. He's a villain. All right, All right. he's villainous. Okay. Which makes sense. It says, when revealed, search the encounter deck and discard pile for the psionic shield attachment and attach it to Exodus in shuffle. So he, he has a when revealed ability, and then he also has three boost. Okay. Three boost. 
Not four, uh, but you three. Know what? Three boots. He also doesn't have victory on there, so he's immortal. He just gets shuffled back in. Shuffled right. Back in. Oh, well, wait. Could. Yeah. That's what a lot of them are like. Okay, so putting his backstory aside, okay, uh, one one villainous, which is nice because I like a minion that has villainous because you get a boost effect. Maybe you know, could be a yes. four attack. Six hit points is is decent, right? That's not a tiny health. He's got the elite trait, which is nice. Retaliate one, so you don't want to ping him. The when revealed, we're gonna read about Sonic Shield in a second with three boosts. So on his own as a minion, he's pretty good. Yeah, not bad. When not bad. when you know his backstory, he is super disappointing when you know his backstory. <laughs> so he doesn't have toughness or piercing or overkill or uh, uh, yeah. 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 Hmm. I mean, when he comes out, he should really take over one of your allies. He should have piercing. He should. He should do, just do all the. It should just say do all the things. Just do all the yeah, things. Yeah. Like defeat yeah. your opponent. De- de- defeat the hero. Right? You lose. And he pops out. <laughs> Game over. Yeah. yeah. He, he takes one possession player, of your hero. You're dead. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I mean, well, obviously, FFG, Caleb, and these guys—they can't do that with this, right? Uh, right. Well, right. wait. They yeah. they could. They, okay, they, they could, could totally do it. You know, yeah, he might not come they're out. They're not going to. <laughs> no, they're not going to. They're not going but, to. But, you know, here we've got a card. We're looking at it. What do you guys think of the artwork? Oh, it's pretty good. I mean, he looks cool. Yeah. He, I really he like feels it. like pretty foreboding. And I really like his hair. Like, that's impressive hair. It's kind of like just mm-hmm. up and it, it looks like a uh, looks like a hair gel commercial. Yeah, so do you think he a... uses a lot of product or does he just use his mind powers to make it stand up for the way he wants? <laughs> he either tricks you into thinking he looks like that. Because who knows, he could just be controlling oh, you. Right. Or he's using telekinesis, or he's using his hair lifting power. Maybe his hair is so terrified of him, it's trying to escape. Because he's so powerful. Mm-hmm. I do, the art is cool, I like the red behind him, he looks pretty cool. So, well, I love the thing around, you know, I don't know what it is, it's like, I call it a pop collar, but it's that, you see it all in all the images with him, he's got that, that the image behind him. I don't know if that's uh, yeah. Some sort French, of weird, like... is it French, Egyptian, I don't know. But anyway. French Fashion Week here, yeah, yeah, that's cool. All right, well, James, when he comes out, he's going to put out a Psionic Shield. Why don't you tell us about the Psionic Shield? Yeah, gladly. So the Psionic Shield, it is an attachment. It is psionically traded, attached to a minion. Otherwise, Psionic Shield gains surge. Perfect. Forced interrupt. When attached, minion would leave play. Instead, heal all damage from that minion and put it back into play. And then discard this attachment. So that's pretty solid. But wait, there's more. They get plus one scheme and plus one attack. Mm -hmm. So this comes out. It's hitting a minion or surging. Surge would be sad. It's going to reboot that minion automatically. Any excess damage you just wasted. And during that time, they're going to get plus one, plus one. And a boost of two. Yeah, and there are two shields... So Exodus can have his from when he comes out, and you could put another one out on a different character. And it doesn't say max one per minion, so he could have two Sinic Shields, which would just give him an extra plus one, plus one, but still. I mean, he, yeah. you know, I mean, three this... plus a boost, and then he's got 18 hit points to go through, minimum. Oh, That'd yeah. be nice. Yeah. Um, You just lose one or you lose them both? You lose them both, right? If you have both of them on there, well, and you defeat them, they both go away? A lot of times that is the case. This one says, when attached minion would leave play, instead, heal all damage from that minion and put it back into play, then discard this attachment. I don't know. Can both forced interrupts simultaneously happen? Make him, I don't, because if you do one of them, he doesn't have any damage. He hasn't left play. I think maybe the second one stays. That's an interesting. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, a lot of times they're like a response. And after this, when he takes any damage, get rid of this card or something like that. And those those leave at the same time. This one's interesting because it says when he would leave play, instead do this. So you have to do it. Then you look at the second psionic shield to interrupt. And you, you there's no he's not leaving play anymore. He's back in play. So I don't mm-hmm. I don't know if they both go away. He might get a double shield. That's an interesting question. I just kind of presume that you, they would both go know. away. Yeah. No. I, look look in your heart. What does your heart tell you? <laughs> your heart tells you he definitely gets two of these. Yeah, you have to that's what my heart tells me. Time. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. what it is, everyone. That's what it is. Yep, that's how we're gonna play it. That'll be the new question. What's on your heart tonight? 
the, the space. <laughs> Look in your heart tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so this is why he doesn't have toughness because he has a sonic shield, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And so this is part of his card, really. I mean, he so he's actually schemed to attack of two, right? It's this not he's not going away while this is out on the table. And it's cards like this that make me Unless hesitant to be promoted from being a minion because this is never going to go on to the villain. It's only ever going to go on to a minion. You don't always get those kinds of perks as the villain. This is a nice minion card. It is a nice minion card. Now, you could play Exodus, and both of these psionic shields are already in play, and he won't get one. Right. That's true. I mean, you're having a bad enough day as it is, so that's okay. It is bad. Like, I guess maybe a four-player four player game, that could happen, right? Hmm. I like that attachment. I think it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, me too. The he's double psionic. He's double psionic. I don't know if that does anything for us, but... All right, this shield psionic and he's psionic. All right, let me tell you about another card here called Acolyte Frenzy. And there are two of these treacheries. When revealed, each Acolyte minion engaged with you activates against you. If you're not engaged with an Acolyte minion, this card gains surge. Special okay. boost icon. You are stunned and confused. Oh, okay, oh. that's that's good. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Acolyte um, stall you out. Yeah, so let's let's Acolyte minion it activate against you you have to be engaged with it it would be really cool if it was like each acolyte minion activates against you so if there was some across the table in a multiplayer game they turn around and come after you Ooh. so i bet you this card surges more than it doesn't um because pins i mean especially on. yeah i mean if you just play with the exodus modular set there's only one acolyte minion it's exodus right so you know what are the chances that he's out and this comes up mm -hmm. so that's a little disappointing, but uh, the boost is pretty neat. I like that one. Stun and confused. Considering it takes maybe possibly an extra turn to get Exodus off the table, I've put this in Rhino before, and I've got hit with the with the frenzy before. Okay. You know, and like in a deck like that. So. Yeah. And I mean, if you shuffle it in with the Acolyte set, right? There's like five Acolyte minions in that set, so mm -hmm. it would go off mm -hmm. a lot more often. So. That's right. It's okay. Great. I I yeah. I still feel like it's. I think the boost maybe is a little better than the rest just because it's most likely going to surge. But I don't know. It surges into a psionic shield or it surges into an exodus. That's okay, too. Okay. So yeah. It's going to do it's, something. It's a must include. Um, to be fair, if you're playing exodus, do yourself a favor. Play acolytes. You just they, yeah. they, they belong together. Like it just it makes this card worthwhile. Make make your encounter deck worthwhile. All right. Well, Bill, there's one more. What is uh, what is exodus doing or what is his scheme? His side scheme is that he is the Herald of Avalon. Exodus sees Magneto as the savior of mutant kind and serves as his Herald, is our text. It says, when defeated, the player who defeated the scheme searches the encounter deck and discard pile for Exodus and reveals him in shuffle. It has a hazard icon on it and three boost. It starts with six threat. Okay, I like this card. This is nice. Three boost, always good. Six threat. It looks That's... so good. I mean... Solo, two-player game, six is fine. Four-player game, six isn't much. Um, but there's a hazard. And then when you kill it, Exodus comes out with his psionic shield. Yeah, that's a good card. So. It's absolutely crippling when you're playing solo. It's so yeah. good. And even the artwork is like, what? They, they don't just look <laughs> good. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Who is that in the artwork in the back that's like up top? That is Rachel Summers. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. And we got, and you got yeah. Gambit, Wolverine, and who's the, the white hair? That is the bottom right. Purple hair? White purple hair? Yeah, I don't know either. Emma Frost? I, I don't know. I mean, it's from a comic, so I don't know. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, all right. So Hazard, that's, you know, you're going to get an extra card every turn. Or the turn you don't want that extra card, you get the extra card of Exodus and his psionic shield. And So he gets out, he comes out, and he's revealed. You said that right. So then he gets his, yeah. Yeah really neat it's like a nice chain reaction of things so you get this out you get exodus out you get a shield out you got three cards of his six now on the table so i'll comment on that then because you know just adding exodus to like i don't know if you guys i like to kind of stick with the number of modular sets that the that the the encounter deck calls for like I don't like if it if it calls for one or two, I don't generally like to just add additional ones to it. But this particular set, if you added it to, for example, if you're playing with Magneto and you're using the Alkalites, 
you're not really watering down the deck because if these cards don't go off, they just surge into something else or they go up and grab another one of the cards from this set. So it's not like these six cards are taking away from or watering down your set. So this certainly would work like in a Magneto deck and it would be incredibly thematic. I think we mentioned that earlier. So that's yeah. what I think I like the most about this set is that it's an add, add it to, to the encounter deck, but it doesn't really water things down and if anything it makes it a whole lot more difficult to try to get through yeah i think I that's that. that's yeah yeah i like it a lot yeah and and like yeah. you said he plays well with the acolytes which we'll talk about next week um mm -hmm. there's a side scheme in, in there that would make him guard there's a you know his side scheme yeah that's just yeah it's good stuff his yeah. cards activate them so you'll have a bunch out there yeah i don't think it waters it down and he gives it a little bit of flair so mm -hmm. so let's um well, let's give it a grade then. Uh, you know, we typically do a little schoolhouse grading here. Uh, what, what do you think, Bill? You're the you're the expert on ex Exodus. Yeah, I for me this is an A plus. I really like the Exodus set. I play with this one a lot. Um, okay. I like the fact that it's that's found in the back of one of the packs. That's always appealing to me. I love it. Something something additional that they throw in the back that you can throw in the encounter deck to mix things up. And I like the way that this mixes things up and makes it makes the game whatever game you're playing it's a little bit more of a challenge, which is what you would expect from Exodus. So I'm giving it an A plus. I really like it. Cool. All right, James. Hmm. So coming into this, this was definitely a solid A for me, possibly an A plus. But I think that with Bill's great background, it's dropped a bit for me. I just feel a bit sad that Exodus, I know he's like, in, he's strong, he's great, but he just doesn't feel like an Omega level mutant now. So now I'm going to drop down to a B. Like, I still love the set, love playing it, but I kind of want more from the main minion now. I ruined it for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes I, me feel so bad. <laughs> but then you made me feel much better by basically just reminding me, no, just throw it in with the acolyte set, call that one encounter set, and you're done. And it, it kind of boosts yeah. him back up again. But yeah, he just, I don't know, it, he, for being so all everything normally. It loses points for theme for Exodus's power level, which okay. seems fair, right? Um, but Bill, you should feel good about your villain status if you're making someone else feel bad. Okay, oh. well, yeah. I need to get used to this idea. I gotta get used to this chair. Yeah, villains rise when you knock someone else down. That's, I mean, okay. we climb on the, you know, we climb on the backs of those we've defeated, and so that's how we. Uh, yeah, okay. Maybe Sorry, sit James. up in my chair a little bit. Thank you. There's no way you're climbing out of that chair. It looks really comfy. I cannot believe that those guys aren't here. There's no way you're climbing out of that chair. Look, yeah. there's a little footstool too, and it pops out when you lean. Well, there's back. a cooler on the other side too, and there's oh, some nice. doors for chilling. I didn't in it. realize yeah. that. Yeah, and a yeah. place to put the remote. Yep, nice. Ooh, it vibrates. Ooh. Oh well, before before, before things get out of hand here, uh, thanks guys for coming on for um, you know replacing Mike and Daniel, and um, yeah. Well, thanks Steve for having us. Yeah, you're welcome. Always a pleasure. Love it. Folks out there want to tell us about their experiences with Exodus, if they think the theme is a mismatch, if they like the set, they don't care about that, you can get a hold of us. You can email us at criticalencounterspod at gmail.com or Critical Encounters on Facebook. You can find our YouTube, our Twitch, or our Patreon by searching for Critical Encounters Podcast. And on Discord, we are Vardane board game lawyer and darcy if you like our show tell your friends if you don't like our show tell your enemies exodus take us out i proudly serve in the house and name of magneto i purposely didn't say Big from Love and Wandering took. Uh, I'm curious how many people will be like, are they really off the show? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> they'll be back. They'll be back, yeah. guys. Don't get worried. No, they'll no be back. villain ever really they'll dies. No one yeah. ever really leaves the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Do not let your heart be troubled.